Now I'd like to call to the stage a great friend of NACD. This is someone who has worked very hard his entire career with the NRCS to make this country's conservation de delivery system the best in the world. Leonard Jordan is the acting chief of the Natural Resources Conservation Service. Before being named acting chief, he served as the NRCS Associate Chief of Conservation. In this role, Leonard led the agency's conservation mission area, including all of NRCS's conservation programs. During his distinguished 37-year career with the NRCS, Leonard has also served as the regional conservationist for the Southeast region, Def Deputy Chief for Strategic Planning and Accountability, Division Director of Conservation Planning and Technical Assistance, and Director of the Conservation Easement Programs Division. He hasn't done a whole lot. Leonard is a Tennessee native and has served as an NRCS state conservationist from Georgia and Washington State. <clears throat> Little side note is um, 18 years ago I moved to Washington State from, from Indiana and was much skinnier and had a little bit more hair and I was working with a easement on my property and I worked with uh, state conservationist Jordan at the time and I know he doesn't remember that but I, I sure do. He, he treated me great at the time. So please join me in welcoming my friend and a friend to everyone in this room, <laughs> Acting Chief Leonard Jordan. There's a lot of people out there. Good morning. Thank you, my friend Michael. And he's right, I don't remember that. <laughs> but I'm sure it was all good, right? Uh, I'm delighted to be here again. Uh, it's funny, I think we met last as this group in Denver almost a year ago. And at that time, I stood up after about eight days of being uh, informed that I would serve as the acting chief. And I don't know what I said then, but it, I'm sure that it was good. But I had no dream, no vision of I would still be here <laughs> in action capacity. So Doc, things do move slow sometimes, right? But I'm delighted. And I, I, first of all, I just want to compliment all of you. Uh, some things have changed. Uh, a year ago, I put these things on periodically. And I have found of recent that I should just wear them constantly because things look different when they're on versus when they're not on. I can actually see things and it makes a difference. Look, thank you very much for the opportunity. I, I feel that I have been once again mistreated. And it's been that way for my whole life. You know, I have to follow that young lady from the great state of Tennessee, of course, the F.S. Lady Julia. Uh, and then I have to follow Dr. Clovis. You guys got off easy. That guy has jokes that he, he could have still been standing here. In fact, I was hoping that he'd get carried away and forget his script and we do those things because it's quite fascinating. Thank you, Doc. And then the policy of sustainability panelists. Uh, so everything I could possibly be, think about saying has already been said. And then we had the President Van Dyke on the President's message yesterday. He said five pages of my six pages. <laughs> so <laughs> then I find myself in a position of being the last person before the session ends. I've been mistreated once again. <laughs> but sincerely, I'm very uh, delighted and excited to be with friends, uh, to be with family. And to the President, Van Dyke, Kim, Michael, Tim, Lee, Jeremy, all of the leadership of your association in ACD, and of course, all of you. Thank you for putting up with me for 41 years. I keep getting cheated. There was a time in my life 
that I want to keep the numbers down. But now I, I want to be able to celebrate how many there are. So 41 years of, of working with tremendous people like yourselves. Uh, we, we, we have done tremendous things. And we've only done those things because of us working together. I mean, I know you know this better than I. Uh, I, I, I truly believe, and I hope you agree, that by us working together, we can accomplish much, much more than we could ever possibly accomplish working independent of each. And it's through those collaborative efforts, those many partnerships, and above all things, the passion, the dedication, the commitment that all of you have, we've been able to provide class one service to the people around this country that make this country great, the farmers, the ranchers, and the forest landowners. And it's because of what we have done together. And you should give yourselves an applause for that. <coughs> uh, you, again, you know, I grew up on a, a small farm. Uh, by the way, let me just say, this is my home state. Did you get that earlier? But if you didn't, I want to make sure you don't leave without knowing that. All right? It's kind of important. I grew up on a small farm three hours west of here. So yesterday, I think it was the Commission of Ag, Tennessee Commission of Ag was talking about uh, growing cotton. I guess he was introducing, indicated he had cotton. I said, that guy must be close to where I'm from. And indeed, he is slightly north of where I grew up. But I grew up on a, a very, very small farm. And, and my father had wisdom. Now, at that time, I didn't call it wisdom. I just called he wanted to make us work to death. But, but, but he had wisdom about taking care of the land. And as a result of, of that practice, those practices, we were able to, on a small 134-acre farm, we, we rented a couple hundred acres to grow peas. You don't know anything about that. It's about that long, purple sometimes. But we were able to, to utilize his common sense in taking care of the land. And you know what happened? We were able to, he was able to provide, it was 10 of us kids. I heard that. <laughs> he was able to provide for all 10 kids on that small acreage. And it was because he realized that that land was the most critical thing that he possessed. And if he took care of it, it would take care of us. That's what you do. That's what this partnership does. We realize that the farmers and the ranchers, forest owners around this country, we realize they know that the land that they operate is their livelihood. And they want to do everything within their power to sustain that livelihood, to protect it to enhance it, because through those efforts, they can provide for their families. But they, only, they also provide for what? The, the community. And then you just start rolling it up. Their families, the communities, the state, and this entire country. When we work with those folks, as partners, resource agencies, and the NGOs, or whatever. We should work with them with a strong passion and desire to equip them to continue their stewardship practices and their efforts, because the value of that to the entire American public. That makes sense to me. Does it make sense to you? I mean, we need those folks, and they, but then they go out and guess what? My dad, my brother and I, who live somewhere close, I hope he's not here. My dad, because we were doing okay, 
he would go out and hire people. Then I thought, I, I said, I got it made now because he's going to hire people. I don't have, I can kick back, right, relax. Wrong. But, but he was able to go out and hire people. And there's some of those people, that was the only paycheck that they got. So you, when you hear this stuff about how to, uh, what is it, uh, stimulate the local economy, my dad did that. You do that. The people that you represent do that. By us providing the resources that they need to practice good stewardship on their operation, folks, it helped to stimulate, stimulate the local rural economy. That makes a difference, don't you think? And so, so but, but here's the deal. Great success, much more work to be done, but things are changing. Things are changing, right? Uh, for the last 83 years of this partnership, we have, I've been working with the great customers, but I see a change. The customers are changing. You know, there's 60, what, 65% of the beginning farmers are at, under the age of 55. Those are young folks, especially if you look at where I am. But, but their needs, their, their desires, their demands are different than the great customers we worked with before. They require a different platform for which they get information. They receive technical assistance. We've done a great job over 83 years. The success speaks for itself. But someday, and Dr. Clovis said this early on, and he said, uh, uh, what are we doing? Because some of, some of us are gonna leave eventually. Some sooner than others. And, <laughs> and if we care, as I'm sure that we do, about the resources that carries this country, we would be thinking about how to ensure sustainability of that model and an improved model because what we do now is going to be even more important in the future. So the people that we're going to be working with are a little different and we have to tweak our model in order to make sure we're providing information in a manner that they are accustomed to. And I think, I think we can do that. Uh, I, I think the panelists talked about, uh, well, if they didn't, I'm just gonna say they did. They talked, about, they talked about others are interested, and I think one of the Phil the Market may have mentioned Walmart. And, and there is a move afoot. You know, conservation is catching on. It's a buzzword, it's catching on. And, and companies like Coca-Cola and in Walmart are paying attention and they are willing to what? Invest. They are willing to invest because they want to make sure that the, their customer base, those customers having a desire to know that their food is produced sustainably, they want to know where their food come from, so these other companies are getting it. They paying attention and they want to incentive, they, I think they want to provide incentives to those producers to keep on doing the great things for which they are doing. Customer change. Uh, but then as I said about the new customer, we must tailor and we must fit our delivery of our assistance to make sure that we provide them what they need and to the extent possible when they need it so then they can make, continue to make improvements on those operations that sustain this country, this great country that we're in. Now to do that, uh, I, I think Dr. Clovis and the gentleman on the Mississippi that every time I hear him, he motivates me. He said, one person, can one person make a difference? One person can make a difference. So what we have to do though, I think to, to make all of this keep moving forward is we got to we got to market ourselves a little bit better. We need to uh, uh, enhance 
I'm going to say the believers in conservation. We need to reach out and inform others about the true value of conservation and how that, how that the, the conservation impact their lives. And, and you know, this thing I've seen buttoned around the air acre counts. There are people on landscapes that don't know what you know, but they are relying upon what you do and what you know. So we need to reach out, uh, develop new champions. We need to reach out, inform the uninformed. Uh, Dr. Clovis, when he uh, meet with us to uh, bestow us with some of that energy and wisdom that he, <laughs> that he has, he said, he said, you know what? We need to package what we do, paraphrasing a little bit, Doc, package what we do put a compelling story together that we can take that story any place, the hill, any place, downtown Nashville, downtown Atlanta, in a metropolitan area that you may be accustomed to, we can take that compelling story and we can put them in a position that they can't say no. Pretty close? Pretty close. So, and that's what each of you, I know you do it, and if you don't, start now because you care, but we need to make sure other people have that same passion, that intimate relationship with what conservation is doing across this country, what it has done, what it will continue to do. You need to reach out and inform the uninformed so that we can grow more customers and we can keep this dynamic partnership conservation effort moving in a positive direction. I, 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 I follow Brent Dykes around, I'm sorry, President Van Dykes around, and, and I think we were in Montana, or maybe in New Mexico, it doesn't really matter, and uh, we were talking about, you know, we are solid. This partnership is extremely solid. We have had success with the model that we have operated under. And he said to me, yeah, but the people that we're looking in the future, they're gonna realize something different. So we may need to tweak our model. And I also told this and my wife, I hope she's not in the room because if I give her ideas, she's gonna figure out the next thing to tell me to do. But, but I, I use this analogy of a, of a piece of property that I have. And I bought it in 06, I think, yes. It fitted every need that I had. But now, being 2018, and I'm desperate to sell it, but I have found out that I'm going to have to make some changes to that property because the people that are now possibly interested, they want something different than what I wanted when I bought it in 06. So my mistake, and honey, if you're here, I didn't mean it that way, was to talk to my wife about what do you think? What are we doing? Oh my God, I have changed countertops, light fixtures, something called splash guards in my kitchen. I never knew what it was. And she said, dear, if you want to sell it, remember, you're not buying it. There's a market out there and you have to make sure that it's attractive to the new market. And oh yeah, I had to have Wi-Fi capabilities because you know, these millennials got Wi-Fi. You know, they don't talk, but they Wi-Fi, whatever that means. So, so what I'm saying is we should be extremely proud of the past and the present. All that passion that we have and all that good stuff we have done that, that, that provides great benefits for all of society, in order for us to carry that on, we have to tweak our model. 
we have to update our model to make sure that we are reaching the new customer base in a way that they totally understand, they get it, they get the fire in their bellies, and they can keep on the journey for which we've been on for, for eight or three years. Uh, the Secretary of Purdue, and I think Dr. Clovis made reference to this as well, uh, has a keen interest, and I think when he came on April, May, uh, from that day to the present, and I'm sure into the future, he will be putting emphasis on improving customer service. But that's what you desire, improve customer service. So uh, he's looking at USDA and all of the agencies within USDA. He's, he's going to force us to collaborate, work together, in order to make sure that we have a consistency, we are sensitive to various needs, and USDA can speak as one voice and address the many needs that the people may have. Uh, you heard about the reorganization of moving NRCS. Now, many of you have heard this, but there may be two or three people that have it. But he took us, NRCS, from the Natural Resource Environment Mission Area, which we were with Forest Service for years and years, great relationship, We'll continue to have a great relationship. And we are now realigning what he said, bringing the family together again. We're new, we are realigning the uh, farm production and conservation mission area for which we have risk management, farm service agency, and of course, NRCS. And again, that is bringing, bringing the family again. Then he has this vision of, of a one USDA. And all of that to me is about ensuring that when farmers, ranchers, and forests owners work, walk in those offices, you know, sometimes they go in those offices and they may not know exactly, exactly what they want. But he wants all of us in those offices, whenever you walk in and the customers walk in, he wants us to be able to provide them class one customer service. Regardless of who's in that office, he wants all of us in that office to be able to assist them, address what they need or what they think they need. And, and I think that's something that you, you agree with. Is that right? Maybe not. Uh, but, but in addition to that, and the mission hadn't changed. The mission of our agency hadn't changed. Our desire and the way we work with producers hadn't changed renewed interest, interest on in increasing customer service, and, and that's kind of important. The other thing, though, in order to, to ensure that, uh, that we provide good customer service, we have to, I think, reinvest in our field staff. Uh, we are short, but that's no secret. So we have to reinvest in our field staff. See, when I was a a district conservationist in uh, Vive, Indiana, back, back then, I was, con believe this or not, when the people that I worked with in that location, they looked at me as if I was an NRCS chief. That's not laughable because oftentimes the people in these local communities they don't know much about area office sometimes, they don't know much about state offices, they definitely don't know much about NHQ and not that they even care, but what they care about is their experience in their local offices. So we need to reinvest, and I know you know this, reinvest in our field employees, equipping them with what they need to address the customer needs whenever he or she walk into those offices. Make sense? Now, <coughs> now, with all of those things and all of the challenges we have faced, and we'll continue to face, but I know that you are committed to become missionaries. You're, you're committed to uh, telling the story far and wide. We got to get our arms around how to communicate the benefits of conservation in a way that all people, wherever you are, get it. So in spite of the challenges, we have had some tremendous successes. Now, I'm going to have to read this to you because these numbers are, are stunning. 
So let me share a few things with you, four different areas. Conservation technical assistance, we all know what that is, right? That's the ability to go out and work with people. Conservation technical assistance program, for the last three years, we've had about $2.6 billion invested in planning and implementation. A lot of folks, especially some that are this from Texas, came in and often they said, you know what, if you didn't have any financial assistance dollars, all I would really want and, could, and had greater value in was a technical assistant. They took great pride and had great priority on having the opportunity to engage with people that has the technical expertise, the science, the technology available that you could provide a system. We have invested over $2.6 in conservation technical assistance in the last three years. And, and that generated an average about a billion dollars of annual economic activities supporting about 1,200 jobs each year. It's making a difference. Through EQIP, everybody knew about EQIP, right? Flagship program. Over the same three years, 14 through 17, we have invested about $3.5 billion in new conservation practices and systems. Generated an average of about $1.7 billion in annual economic activity supporting about 23,000 jobs per year. It's making a difference. The easement program, agriculture conservation easement programs, $663 million invested in the same three years, generating an average of $159 million into the economic activities, 1,900 plus jobs each year. The programs for which we collectively are working to provide to producers around this country are having a profound effect on the land, the resources, but on the people, the local economy. It's making a difference. We're doing that with challenges. So when you do what you're going to do, work that magic, you're going to go back to your communities and the areas of which you're from. And you're going to start talking about the value of conservation, what it means to you personally, but what it means to your communities, your state, and your country. We're going to get more champions, new champions, and we're going to be able to take the, the results I just shared with you, triple it. Think about when that happens, the impact we will have on this country. Are you ready to line up and go be on doors? Uh, So, all of that being said, I have heroes. You have a hero? My dad, my mom is my hero. But the farmers, the ranchers, and the forest owners around this country that voluntarily put conservation on their land, they are my heroes. You are my heroes because you get it. You know how valuable the soil and the water resources are. But more importantly, you know that you have to keep doing what you do to sustain your operations, that you, your kids, your grandkids, and as Dave White would say, the little Americans that are yet to come are beneficiaries of your hard work. Thank you very much.